It looks like the U.S. is going to be more involved in Syria under Trump, but I am not at war. What's in the news were stories on government indoctrination centers, government ignoring the Constitution, closing asset forfeiture loopholes, political correctness police with teeth, and secession in the U.S. And a road segment on counties in Oregon that are actually shutting down government services. This episode is brought to you by Praxis, where you can get a full-time job in nine months, making $50,000 a year with no college degree. Also brought to you by Rye Guys T-Shirts, the makers of all of the Pax Libertas Productions T-Shirts, including for this show. A rye wit for today's shit. Welcome to the Lava Flow. Channeling the flow of information to the libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, and agorist community. Find us at thelavaflow.com. Here's your host, Roger Paxton. Thank you for joining me this week. Coming to you from the state that is the home of the largest truly libertarian yearly event in the world, Porkfest, this is the show that will bring you the people, places, and events that everyone in the Liberty Revolution needs to know. You can catch me on Twitter at the Lava Flow Pod. This is episode 62. I am not at war in Syria. And it's Tuesday, May 23rd, 2017, when there have already been more than 460 people killed by police this year. What's wrestling my jimmies this week? You're about to find out. Let's do it to it. Now, I don't talk a lot about foreign policy and war on this show for several reasons. First of all, there are far better libertarians at giving you the scoop on that, such as Scott Horton and the teams at Antiwar.com and the Libertarian Institute. Secondly, though, I try to focus this show on topics that affect us directly as much as possible so that we can try and find solutions to helping us live that voluntary lifestyle today. However, when I hear the beating drums of war, like I did this week, I feel like I have to address it. Apparently, the Nobel Peace Prize winning President Obama, who escalated our involvement in Syria, was only a drop in the bucket in that country. Now President Trump is going to escalate things even further by instructing the Pentagon to, quote, annihilate the Islamic State in Syria in a bid to prevent escaped foreign fighters from returning home. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis said that the president has, quote, directed a tactical shift from shoving ISIS out of safe locations in an attrition fight to surrounding the enemy in their strongholds so we can annihilate ISIS. The intent is to prevent the return home of escaped foreign soldiers. Interestingly enough, though, ISIS in Syria and the U.S. government both seem to have the same end game in Syria in mind, which is the removal of Bashar al-Assad as the head of the Syrian government. The U.S. government, of course, wants to put up their hand-picked puppet ruler, while ISIS wants to do the same. What's worse is who is poised to take control if the U.S. gets its way and takes out both ISIS and Assad in Syria. Based on commentary provided by David Nelson at the Libertarian Institute, it seems pretty clear that the group that has the strength to take over Syria if the U.S. removed Assad would be none other than Al-Qaeda. Remember those guys? They flew a few planes into some buildings in the U.S. a few years ago? And right now, the CIA continues to arm the Free Syrian Army, a group of so-called moderate rebels who, come to find out, are dominated on the ground by predominantly al-Qaeda and similar jihadist terrorist groups. As David Nelson said, quote, As a result, many of the weapons distributed by the CIA to these supposedly moderate fighters wound up in the hands of al-Qaeda and its allies. Now, is there anybody in the world who can honestly look me in the face and say that this is a good thing? Of course not, but it's happening all the same. Looks to me like there is no winning this game, so maybe the U.S. should just try to stay the hell out of it for a change. Now, where have I heard that before? Strange game. The only winning move is not to play. But what's the best for the Syrian people? First of all, it would be best for the Syrian people if the U.S. government would immediately stop arming, training, and aiding violent jihadist rebels in the country. This would tip the balance of the war to one side, which would bring about a fairly quick end to the war, probably. The people losing the most in this war are the citizens of Syria, the people who just want to live their lives, raise a family, or just be left alone, just like you and I. They're being bombed and slaughtered indiscriminately in a war that is being perpetrated by groups that are propped up by the United States government, with yours and my tax dollars. Look, Assad is no good guy. There's no doubt about that. And I would never say that he is. But at this point in time, he is certainly the lesser of many evils. 
As David Nelson also said, quote, While the American media consistently points out Assad's human rights abuses and authoritarian behavior, some of which is true, the Syrian people under Assad live relatively free and normal lives. Syria is one of the more liberal countries in the region and compared to life under the rule of ISIS or Al-Qaeda, which behead children and enforce strict and brutal Sharia law, there's no question that Syrians are better off living under Assad. And that's a fact. There's no way they're better off with this war going on in their cities that resulted in more than 6 million civilians being internally displaced within Syria and driven nearly 5 million more out of Syria, not to mention the nearly half a million civilians killed. Remember, boys and girls, the U.S. government is as complicit as anyone for the refugee crisis in Syria. David Nelson goes on to say, quote, The humanitarian instinct to oppose the Assad regime is understandable. But it's important to realize that Assad's actions, as brutal as they may have been at times, were in direct response to the rise of extremist groups in his country who engaged in far worse and more vital acts. There's no clear reason to think that a guy who's been in charge for many years before this civil war started is interested in committing genocide against his own people just for fun. These groups threatened his regime, which was only possible because of the support of America and its CIA. And a post-Assad regime led by the rebels would certainly be far worse for Syrian civilians. You know, I can't agree more with this statement. Look, if you or I had the choice to live in America under Obama or Trump or to live in Syria under Assad, we would unquestioningly choose America every single time. However, that's not the question facing the Syrian citizens right now. Their choice is far grimmer and far more difficult. It's to live under a dictatorial Assad in relative peace or to live under constant threat of war, bombings, beheadings, kidnappings, and murder. Sure, none of us would choose to live under Assad, but for the millions displaced in or out of Syria today, living under a peaceful Assad regime would look pretty good to them right about now. For the sake of the Syrian people, the U.S. government should cease operations in Syria immediately. The U.S. involvement is doing nothing more than making their suffering greater and prolonging this horrible war. And they're doing it with money stolen from you and me. Fuck war in the neck. Or as the late, great Roger Lee Wrights put it much more elegantly, I am not at war. Have you subscribed to the Lava Flow on iTunes or any mobile device yet? Then what's wrong with you? Go to thelavaflow.com slash subscribe so you don't miss a minute of the show. And while you're subscribing, make sure to leave me a five-star rating and review the show to help others find our podcast. TheLavaFlow.com slash subscribe. What's in the news? The news you need to know from a libertarian perspective. In Government Indoctrination Center news, a Trenton, Ohio middle school student was suspended after liking a photo of a gun on Instagram. I shit you not. Seventh grader Zachary Bolin received a 10-day suspended sentence from Edgewood Middle School after he liked a photo of an airsoft gun on Instagram. The caption of the photo simply said, ready. Wait, it wasn't even a real fucking gun? Are you serious right now? Zachary said, quote, I don't think I did anything wrong. The next morning, they called me down and, like, patted me down and checked me for weapons. Then they told me I was getting expelled or suspended or whatever. They patted a kid down for liking a post on social media. What the actual fuck? The note the school sent home to Zachary's parents said that the official cause of his suspension was, quote, liking a post on social media that indicated potential school violence. Zachary's father, Martin Boland, said, quote, I was livid. He never shared, he never commented, never made a threatening post. He just liked it. And let's be clear, the post that he liked wasn't threatening in any way. In a statement released to WXIX, the superintendent of Edgewood City Schools said, quote, I assure you that any social media threat will be taken seriously, including those who like the post when it potentially endangers the health and safety of students or adversely affects the educational process. Look, what adversely affected the educational process for Zachary was you jackasses taking him out of school for liking a social media post. Let's be clear about that. School administrators agreed to lift the suspension after speaking with Zachary's parents. Thank goodness. This is exactly why zero-tolerance rules are for people with zero intelligence. Clearly, this was no threat in any way to the school. It was a fucking airsoft gun, not a deadly weapon, and this post had literally nothing to do with school. This is way out of hand. They would likely suspend my kid for getting a BB gun for Christmas, for crying out loud. 
Think Rothbard. My kids never have to be subjected to this sort of nonsense and non-thinking mentality. In unfit-to-exist news, apparently the First Amendment protections of the freedom of the press mean exactly nothing in the West Virginia State Capitol building. Reporter Dan Heyman attempted to ask Health and Human Services Secretary Tom Price a question about the Republican health care bill, and he was arrested for, quote, willful disruption of state government processes. Price and Kellyanne Conway, special counsel to the president, had been walking through a hallway in the West Virginia State Capitol when veteran reporter Heyman began following alongside him, holding up his phone to Price while attempting to ask him a question, just like thousands and thousands of reporters have done in history. Heyman repeatedly asked the secretary whether domestic violence would be considered a pre-existing condition under the Republican bill to overhaul the nation's health care system, he said. According to the recording that Heyman provided the Washington Post, Heyman asked, quote, Do you think that's right or not, Secretary? You refuse to answer? Tell me no comment. A male voice is then heard on the recording telling Heyman, quote, Do not get close to her. Back up. Moments later, an officer in the Capitol pulled Heyman aside, handcuffed him, and arrested him. Heyman was jailed on the charge of willful disruption of state government processes and was released later on a $5,000 bail. Heyman, in a news conference after being released from jail, said, quote, This is my job. This is what I'm supposed to do. I think it's a question that deserves to be answered. I think it's my job to ask questions, and I think it's my job to try to get answers. Absolutely. Before Heyman's arrest, no police officer told him that he was in the wrong place, Heyman said. He was wearing a press pass and a shirt with a public news service logo on the front and identified himself to police as a reporter. At the news conference, Heyman's lawyer called the arrest a, quote, highly unusual case, yeah, no kidding, and said he had never had a client arrested for, quote, talking too loud. The lawyer, Tim DePiro, described Heyman as a mild-mannered, reputable journalist and called the arrest bizarre and way over the top. Heyman's worked as a reporter for about 30 years, and his stories have appeared in the New York Times, NPR, and other national news outlets. Since 2009, he's worked as a West Virginia-based producer and reporter for Public News Service, which promotes content to media outlets while also publishing its own stories. Lark Corbeil, uh, chief executive and founder of Public News Service, said Heyman's arrest took the organization very much by surprise. Corbeil said in an interview, quote, From what we can understand, he did nothing out of the ordinary. He was doing what any journalist would normally do, calling out a question and trying to get an answer. Now, this is absolutely disgusting. In a building that is supposedly the people's house, <laughs> yeah, right, the First Amendment, of course, no longer applies. Price was in a public area, walking in the hallway and not behind closed doors. If reporters are no longer allowed to ask questions of our supposed rulers in public places, this is just more proof that our wannabe rulers are above the law, above the populace, and above the Constitution. If police officers can stop you from exercising your First Amendment right anytime they choose, you no longer have that right in practice, which is exactly why Lysander Spooner was right and the Constitution is unfit to exist. I couldn't care less if this arrest is overturned by the courts. The practical effect is the same. This reporter was stopped from exercising his rights, and no one will be held ultimately accountable. The officer who made this arrest will not face any charges or repercussions, guaranteed. The officer's supervisors will also face no repercussions for their lack of training this officer in the First Amendment. This is a disgrace. Look, guys, I'm sure you know that student loan debt is at a collective $1.4 trillion, with 25% of graduates still struggling to find meaningful employment. Instead of being a statistic, you can choose to live life on your own terms and join the intellectually stimulating collaborative community of Praxis. While getting a paid apprenticeship with a dynamic growing company, Praxis participants receive intensive professional development that they describe as freedom, empowerment, creativity, progress, achievement, inspiring, and challenging that leads directly to a full-time job. To learn more about how you can ignite your future with this fire-starting collaborative community of Praxis, go to discoverpraxis.com slash lava. Also, to make sure to check out the Praxis podcast called Forward Tilt, hosted by the founder of Praxis, Isaac Morehouse. Each week, Isaac shares stories and lessons about the future of work. These are the ideas and experiences that shape the Praxis mindset, delivered in five to ten minute doses to help you create a great career. Make sure to add it to your podcatcher today. In legalized theft news, the Colorado legislature overwhelmingly passed a bill that would take a huge step towards closing a federal asset forfeiture loophole. 
Important provisions in the bill would prohibit Colorado law enforcement agencies from transferring seized property to a federal agency unless it has a net value of more than $50,000. It would also prohibit state and local police from accepting payment or distribution from a federal agency of all or part of any forfeiture proceeds resulting from the adoption, a joint task force, or other multi-jurisdictional collaboration unless the aggregate net equity value of the property and currency seized in the case is in excess of $50,000. The case is commenced by the federal government, and it relates to a filed criminal case. In most situations, the passage of this bill would slam closed a loophole that allows state and local police to get around more strict state asset forfeiture laws by passing the stolen goods and money to the feds and then getting back a portion of the stolen items back from the feds. This is essentially money laundering by the government. This is exactly how money laundering works. I've got money that I need to make clean. I give it to somebody who takes some of that money for the service, then gives me some of it back in a clean state. If you or I did this, we'd go to jail. When police do this, it's considered thinking outside the box and completely legitimate. This bill will now go to the governor's desk for signature. If you live in Colorado, and I know I have lots of listeners there, I encourage you to call the governor and tell him that you expect him to sign this bill into law. In I Can't Make This Shit Up news, a Scottish YouTuber comedian Marcus Meacham, a.k.a. Count Dankula, (laughs) is facing up to a year in prison for teaching his girlfriend's pug to be a Nazi. The idea behind the video was to play a prank on his girlfriend by having her pug, Buddha, learn to do tricks to the sound of offensive Nazi slogans such as Gas the Jews and Seagull. The video went viral, receiving millions of views and landing on the front page of Reddit. Most people laughed at the joke and didn't interpret it as supportive of Nazi values, but the Scottish police were not amused. A month after Meacham posted the video, police arrived at his front door and threw him in jail for the night. He will appear before a judge this week facing a hate crime charge with a maximum sentence of one year in prison. He's also already lost multiple jobs as a result of the video. Meacham could become the very first Scottish comedian to be jailed for a joke. Meachin said he fears the judge will try to make an example of him because of the amount of attention the case drew from the British press. His trial will have no jury, and his sentencing is entirely up to the judge's discretion. Reportedly, Meachin is still together with his girlfriend Sue, through the controversy and media attention, and their pug Buddha is still a raging anti-Semite. Guys, this is just crazy. Who in the hell was harmed by this dog doing tricks at the command Sieg Heil? Is this a tasteless joke? Yeah, of course it is. But the political correctness police apparently have real teeth in Scotland, and they are not afraid to use them against some small-time YouTuber. But think about this. Could you imagine them going after Billy Connolly like this for a tasteless joke? No way in hell. Are you a free spirit with a skeptical mind and a mischievous sense of humor? Are you fed up with pointless wars, official lies, and the abuse of power? Does the Daily News leave you shaking your head? If so, meet the Rye Guys, makers of fun, gullibility-resistant t-shirts for independent thinkers. If you like to laugh and question everything, stop by RyeGuys.com today. That's W-R-Y-G-U-Y-S dot com. The Rye Guys, a wry wit for today's sh- In secession news, conservatives in Washington have about had it with the state's rampant Marxism and are now taking matters into their own hand to reclaim their independence. Republican lawmakers in the state have filed a bill to secede from Washington and create a new state called Liberty. I doubt that would be an accurate name since the Republicans are wanting to do it, but that's what they want to call it anyway. Though conservatives in eastern Washington have attempted to split from the liberal state a number of times in the past 10 years, they do remain hopeful that this time will be their lucky break. According to KIMA-TV reports, quote, the legislature can't split the state in half. The bill asked the president and Congress to do that. If the bill succeeds, this would be an important domino for the secession movement and help inspire other disaffected communities across the nation to secede. As governments decentralize, power is restored to the individual, and communities can appropriately govern themselves as they see fit, without outside influences. Well, this may not be the case if this happens, because the newly seceded area would still be a part of the United States, of course. It would give local people more control on how they're ruled. Of course, I'm sure that I disagree with a lot of what these conservatives in Washington believe, just like I would disagree with a lot that the liberals in California who want to secede believe as well. One thing we can all agree on is that groups of people should have the right to secede as they wish. I just go a little bit further in saying that even the individual himself should have the right to secede as well. 
I wish both of these groups luck in their endeavors as we hopefully can do the same one day through the foundation of New Hampshire Independence here at New Hampshire. In some personal news, I must have been pretty popular the past couple of weeks because I was talked about on several different podcasts, but two of them were pretty notable. So I thought you guys might want to hear them as well. First, there was a discussion on Lions of Liberty called Libertarians in Living Rooms Drinking Liquor. Boy, that's a lot of L's. It was episode 295 of Lions of Liberty, and it had Mark Clare, the main host of Lions of Liberty, John Odermott of Felony Friday, Rimzo Martinez of Rimzo Republic, and Johnny Adams from the Johnny Rocket Launchpad. Johnny was asked what were some of his favorite shows that he's ever done for the Launchpad, and here was his answer in the ensuing conversation. We had Roger Paxton. He was a great show, man. I mean, I love that show with Roger Paxton. And I don't know when this is airing. You know what I don't like about Roger? I got to say, and he's going to listen to the show, so I I feel bad criticizing him. What don't you like about Roger? Every time I listen to him, I feel like so dumb. Because he, he just think is so on top of every issue, and he's like he is such a great way of, of putting everything so succinctly. Where yeah. if, if I have an idea in the middle of a show, especially if, I, if I'm not scripting out what I'm going to talk about, I'll just start talking and I'll ramble and I'll listen to that show later. I'll be like, man, I, I made some points, but boy, I was just all over the place. Then I'll listen to Roger sum it up in like 20 seconds, and I'll be like, damn it, that's what I should have said. That that 20 second Roger answer. So that's what I yeah, don't it, like about Roger. Just kidding. That's yeah, what I love. And he has a, in the neck. That's a great radio voice, Roger. <laughs> Paxton, one of the best libertarian uh, podcast voices. I mean, he's, he sounds yeah. like he should be on the radio. I he sound does. like a child compared to him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he does have a good, like, good bassy voice. He has, he's clean too. He's crisp. Uh, but yeah, he's great. And then Brian Sovereign of Sovereign Tech was talking on one of his Patreon only shows with Dr. Stephanie Murphy about the Resist the Empire podcast that I do with Brian McQuaid. We advertise Resist the Empire on Sovereign Tech because it's a perfect fit of technology, science fiction, and liberty that is the same type of audience as Resist the Empire. Anyway, here's what they had to say. It's by the same guys that do the Lava Lava Flow podcast. I mean, isn't that just one guy? Uh, yeah, well, it's Roger Pax. Well, right? it's Pax Libertas. <laughs> yeah, it's Roger, but and, and of course he's just he's fantastic. He's but. an amazing podcaster. Yes. Yeah, he's really good. High you've, end, high quality. You've played clips on your show from him, and I don't do that often you for don't other do podcasts. That for anybody. You know, like no. that's that's a big yeah, compliment. You got to have something going for you if you're doing that. Thanks, guys, for talking me up. I really appreciate it, and I love to hear when people love listening to my show. Also, guys, remember today is your last chance to win two free general admission tickets to Pork Fest, courtesy of the Lava Flow. This is a hundred and sixty dollar value. Entering the contest is super easy. Take a screenshot from your phone, tablet, or computer showing that you are subscribed to the Lava Flow from any podcatcher at all, and email it to subscribed at thelavaflow.com, and you'll be entered. To make sure I don't miss the email, please put in the subject field subscribed. If you've already subscribed to the show, awesome, then this is going to be super easy for you. Just take a screenshot of it and send it to subscribe at thelavaflow.com. If you've never subscribed before, make sure to do so now and email me the screenshot. Subscribers help with the ranking of the show on iTunes and other podcatchers, and it makes sure that you never miss an episode. The contest will end at midnight tonight, May 23rd, so make sure to get your entries in ASAP. The winner is going to be randomly drawn and notified right away, so you can make all the plans needed to come hang out with me and more than a thousand other libertarians in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Good luck, everybody. Exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per-episode donation of as little as a buck an episode. Or use Bitcoin. Get exclusive content, rewards, and help the lava flow become fiscally neutral while providing you more content. TheLavaFlow.com slash support. Hey, Doc, we better back up. We don't have enough road to get up to 88. Roads? Well, we're going. We don't need roads. People are getting fed up with high taxes, but most people are still going to vote for every single tax increase that comes before them. Quote, for the good of society, even at the detriment of of their own family's budget in a lot of cases. This is evident around the country, and the question most often asked is, without the government, who will build my favorite pet project or provide for my favorite service? But in a lot of places, people have simply had enough. They're no longer voting for tax increases to fund unnecessary services and projects, and they're instead finding out that they can easily do without them. Take Douglas County, Oregon, for example. Inside a big wood-paneled downtown library there, a sign spells out the future in four words. Come June 1st, quote, all services will cease. 
Last fall, Douglas County residents voted down a ballot measure that would have added about $6 a month to the tax bill on a median-priced home and saved the libraries from a funding crisis. So this spring, the library system's 11 branches have slowly been closing. Roseburg's Central Library will be the last to go. Zach Holly, a resident and voter in the area, said, quote, We pay enough taxes. I vote against taxes across the board. Good for him. Curry County, which borders Douglas County, has failed to pass at least four property tax proposals aimed at keeping county services afloat over the last decade. Cuts to the sheriff's office budget there have meant an end to round-the-clock staffing, and even conducting an election this fall could be on the chopping block, since the county clerk only has one full-time staffer left in the department, and they're facing another 30% cut in funding for that department in this year's budget. Just east of Curry County and Josephine County, the jail has been defunded after nine consecutive defeats of public safety tax levies, leading to a policy of catch and release for nonviolent criminals. Hell, that should pretty much be the policy for nonviolent criminals anyway. One home in Curry County went for more than 10 years without paying a penny in property taxes, all because the county assessor's office couldn't field enough workers to go out and inspect the home. The house dodged more than $8,500 in property taxes because the government had gotten too small to even ask for the money. So things fall even further, with cuts to agencies that actually bring in revenue, prompting further cuts down the line. Now that is pretty close to being the perfect size government in my opinion, one that is too small to enforce the theft of your money. At that point, paying taxes becomes voluntary, since only the fools willing to pay their taxes are the ones doing it. Interestingly, the forced improvisation of the existing government services has had unexpected results. Curry County had to merge their Parks Department and the Juvenile Department years ago, which prompted the head of these agencies to use teenage offenders to clean the parks as part of their community service. Recidivism rates went down, and Curry now has one of the state's lowest percentages of juveniles committing a second crime. They're also rethinking how to fund libraries there to bring them back in a new and creative way, such as through some combination of volunteers and privatization. One of the Douglas County Commissioners, Gary Leaf, says he's preparing the argument to make to voters that they will eventually have to pay for public safety services. He said, quote, they'll have to, but will they? They have to? This is part of the problem, that people think that others have to pay for anything. No, really they don't. If they don't value safety, They don't have to pay a thing. If they don't want to use the services provided for their tax money, they can either hire somebody to provide those services or voluntarily pool their money with others to provide the services that they can't afford themselves. This idea that we have to pay taxes to get things is just ludicrous, and it's nothing but a superstition. There's literally nothing that the government can provide that couldn't be provided by the free market better and more economically. It's great to see this anti-tax sentiment spreading in Oregon. We can only hope that it'll spread to other parts of the country as well. Would people die in the streets without 24 by 7 government police presence? Would people be ignorant without government libraries? Would people have nothing to do with their spare time without government parks? Would people never be able to travel anywhere without government roads? Of course not. And even if that were the case, if people valued these things enough, they would just pay for them voluntarily. If people don't value them, That means these services were an unnecessary waste of money and an immoral reallocation of wealth. Wait, I think I just inadvertently defined government. Oops. Thank you for listening to the show this week. As always, I need to thank my favorite chicken farmer, Jessica, for her help with the show. For the show notes to this episode, where I put links and other information that's been on this show, go to thelavaflow.com slash 62. I don't have any new iTunes reviews again for the second time in a row. iTunes really helps to steer people to this podcast based on ratings and reviews, so please go to thelavaflow.com slash iTunes and leave one today. Thanks to everybody who's left me a rating and review already. You guys rock. I also don't have any new supporters this episode, but thanks to all of my awesome supporters, I'm still at $193 per episode or 77.2% of the way towards my next goal of $250. Thanks so much, guys. And if you want more of the lava flow, exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per episode donation of as little as a buck an episode using Federal Reserve notes through Patreon or Bitcoin through Coinbase. I want to be able to bring you more content soon, so make sure to add your donation today to help make that happen. Until next time, keep striking the root. Thank you for listening to The Lava Flow at thelavaflow.com. Don't miss an episode. 
subscribe now at thelavaflow.com forward slash subscribe. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast.